Okay. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to follow the agenda, at least initially, and then we'll bounce around. Uh, we're going to start with a pledge uh, and then go to the roll call of staying with formality and, uh, and then we'll get down to business. So we'll go to the pledge, the flag's over there on my right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so because we usually do roll calls, we'll do it tonight too. Carl Bonamico here. Mike Berdinsky here. Craig Fishbein here. Rob Fritz here. Mike Lidden here. Bob Gross. You guys got to speak up. Uh, Jacqueline back to me. Here. Chris Regan. Here. Jesse Reynolds. Here. Amy Walsh. Here. I think that was alphabetical. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is, is just a just to tidy up our procedures because a quorum is something every organization should have. So, and we didn't decide what a quorum was going to be, and I wanted to decide that tonight. Um, and bring it to vote. I don't think it's really a highly technical or important thing, but just so to put in context what a quorum is all about, unless a quorum is present, you can't vote. So we could pick the quorum and we, whatever we want to do. Um, I was thinking, you know, what would I suggest? I think six, but you know, five, seven, I mean, you know, we can, we can figure that out. It has nothing to do really with um, a meeting under freedom of information. As long as we're properly noticed, you know, with an agenda and we're taking minutes and things like that, we can sit and talk about issues, but we can't vote. The, um, the council decided that no resolution could be carried by this body unless there were seven votes. But as you see, we go down the agenda in case there are recusals or absences, we may not have, you know, 10, we nine, eight, seven. So, you know, the quorum needs to take that into account. Um, you have to wait a second. What was that all about? You're all set up. I was testing you. So that's the significance of a quorum. We, we need a quorum present to, to vote on any, any measure. Um, I'm going to throw out six, but I mean, it could be, it could be less than that. No harm done. It could be, uh, it could be more than that. But if we don't have seven, then it can't be. Mike, the purpose of a quorum is to be able to hold a vote. Yes. Would it be recommended perhaps to have a top number so that you wouldn't end up having ties? Well, if, it, if, if there's a tie um, vote, the measure wouldn't carry. Um, but if we follow that suggestion, it would either be five or seven, nine would be too tight, you know? So, I mean, I think, I think that's, a valid, that's a valid point. Um, as between the two, I'd rather see a lower quorum than a higher quorum, but um, this is not the most important decision in the world. We got other meteor stuff, but let's go around the table, you know, real quick on questions or thoughts. Um, Amy, take a pass or do you want to take a first swing on? Jacqueline. Jacqueline, I'm sorry. Uh, I say seven. Seven? I'm confused as to if it's just if it's six, you can't pull the vote anyway. So why? Well, yeah, let me back up because I went over that too fast. Um, down the agenda, you'll see that I'm, I'm asking for a resolution authorizing me to write to the council to modify that seven vote requirement in the event of recusals or absences. So let's say, hypothetically, we see the applications come in in December, you know, we'll get a list in bulk of all those. And, and this will come up later in the meeting, but we'll all have our eye fall on a bunch of names, a bunch of nonprofits and a bunch of businesses. 
probably we're going to see one or two or three recusals on certain applications because there's going to possibly be so many. So let's say there are three, three recusals on a, um, well, that'd just be on one application. We have to adjust for that with respect to the vote total and the quorum. And we can't, it'd be hard to have seven votes when three have recused, leaving only seven. That's what I, I hope I'm addressing your question. I'm not sure I have. Did I? Yeah. And so if we say seven now, or if we say six now, um, it's in the hopes that the council amends the seven. Yeah. Or, or if we say five now, five, six, or seven. Yeah. 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 No, no. I guess six. I mean, I think more than half on the committee should be here. All right. That business with the committee. We'll keep going around real real quick. Seven. We got a seven. We got a, we got a six. Jacqueline, you said seven. You said seven. Okay. Seven. Craig? So I think six only because you don't want to stymie the business of group. It doesn't that just permits a vote to occur. And therefore, we have a record of what those in attendance had decided. That may not be dispositive of what's before the body based upon what the council does. But you want to at least, I mean, if, you, if it's seven and you don't have seven start of the meeting, it doesn't even have a meeting. But if it's six, you can at least start the meeting, you can call for a vote on a particular item, and depending upon how many votes are required. It, it may be helpful or not. So all we're talking about is whether or not you can have a vote, not whether or not that vote is dispositive. So I'm not sure I'm following you, okay. but I want to clarify one thing if I can. This committee isn't going to do it the way the council does it. The council figures it can't start a meeting without a quorum. Understood. That's their quirk. We can. We just can't vote. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And, and Technically, you could vote with six. Yeah. Even though that matter before you may require seven. That's votes correct. To pass. That's yeah. my point. That's right. So I don't want to preclude a vote from happening. Right. Because there are not seven there. So you're a six guy. I am a six guy. That's that's what I need to know. Yeah, I'll go along with six. I'll go along with there. six. And, and if it uh, if there's a tie, it's just tabled to the next meeting. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Is that true? That it would be tabled, or that it would mean it, just, it would not pass? It would not pass. So therefore, it has to come up again. Well, hold, hold on, one, hold on one sec, because multiple voices are going to are going to mess us up. Um, if you could go through the chair, or or wait till you're, you know, we come or you come around, and but um, I missed. I think I missed your. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I maybe I misunderstood. So thank you for for educating me on, on the matters. If yeah. there were six people and were tied to vote. I would, I, I assume maybe incorrectly that it would just be tabled and moved to the, a meeting where there was the appropriate number of people that could vote. I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah, then I don't yeah. think it's not, it's something that might, and it might be an isolated item that will get pushed to another meeting. That, that, yeah. That's right. And it, it would probably be because of a recusal, that should be one application. Exactly. Um, the rest of the applicant, Craig, hold on one, hold on one, one second. I'm leaning towards six. You're leaning towards six. Okay. So I just, yeah. on that issue, this body could decide that an application needs a certain number of votes. We'll say eight, right? Because I think that would be within the purview of what the council said because seven votes are required. We could go outside that, okay? I don't think that anything mandates because something fails at a particular meeting that it automatically comes up the next meeting. No, it could though. It could. It could. Somebody would have to make a motion. Yeah. So I, on and so forth. No, so, I'm not going to get, or I don't want to get into the details of Robert's rules because that doesn't generally serve us well. I think if it's a three to three tie and six is um, adequate to vote in view of. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the quorum rules, if there's a three to three tie, the strong presumption would be that it would come back. 
it would be very unusual for it not to come back. And that's how I would how I would conduct the agenda. So yeah, uh, certainly a motion could be made to table that particular. Yeah, but the th those formalities, I, the, the presumption would be three, three tie, it comes back until more people are here and the tie is broken. So that's how, I think that's how, how we would, uh, um, how we would do that. Chris, six. You're, you're a six guy. I'm seven. You're a seven guy. So we're going to have a, a Jesse Reynolds. Are you there? Um, yeah, I'm here. Everybody hear me? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not quite. I'm not quite clear on on the, the the difference between six or seven, or I, I do agree that that we don't want it to be so high that we won't be able to meet if we can't meet that quorum. Um, but I don't I don't know I don't really have I mean do I have to offer a number because six or seven nope. would be fine to me. I'm I just think going what, to, I think I'm the, just... the only thing that I would say though is if we manage to lower the number for a quorum and then we have to talk about a seven votes that possibly that we use, like we have to exceed a two thirds majority in order for it to pass. So that, you know, if, if we made it five, if more than three people vote in favor of it, then it passes because seven was used out of 10 because you want it to sort of be a super majority. So to me, the number for a quorum is more relevant to can we hold the meeting and do business because we have a short time frame. So if seven seems too high to people, I'm in favor of six. If six and seven don't matter, or seven, eight, nine, that's why everyone's afraid of it, then, you know, however it works. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't really hold an opinion, but I, I agree with everybody in the room that we should be able to meet when we want to meet and vote. So I guess it more matters whether or not the council is going to allow us to change the seven threshold. In, in the event of recusals or absence, that, that's... Right, right. That's, yeah. So yeah, so, so we would... So um, I get you. Um, so I would at this point entertain a motion that um, a quorum be comprised of six people um, available for voting. And uh, that is that could be changed. We could always redo it if circumstances require. So Mike, um, maybe yeah. you can make a suggestion. So yeah, you want to you have laid, laid on the agenda, you want to talk about uh, Authorize and have a discussion with the council address how to handle the seven vote requirement. Yeah, maybe we should tackle that first. Well, we're just on the cusp of a vote, so let me. The only reason why I'm saying that yeah. is, I, I don't disagree with having less than seven people to have a quorum for purpose of business, but at the same time, we're a, a a commission that's on a short time frame to to act on this. So I think that all of us here have committed to be at at every meeting as physically possible, either physically here or zooming in. So that's why I think let's just stick to our guidance on seven votes. Seven people are here, so we're not delaying action. I mean, that's why we all we all volunteered to be here. So I think that really you can, and then I say I, I would suggest that the next step would be having your conversation with the council of saying, what do we do in these weird odd wall situations where nine people show up and three people recuse themselves or how do we handle that? Well, that'll be on the consent majority. agenda. That'll be on the consent agenda. I'm being, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little <laughs> relaxed on that comment. But yeah. And to, very quickly, to your point, uh, until Mike approaches the council and gets approval, by default, it's seven. It's seven. So yes. To your point. So it, it, by doing what Michael wants to do, it doesn't change anything that we're tasked with at seven votes. Right. It's British right now. So there's no harm done by you both. This is just a, a detail of organizational procedure. That's really all it is. So I'm going to go back and I'll entertain a motion that a quorum uh, be, uh, be six uh, individuals. And um, let's get a second, anybody. Or if someone make the motion, someone say so. I'll move. I'll second. Okay. Um, Craig, uh, Craig made the motion and Chris seconded. Got it. So I'm going to go the, the roll call. Um, give us a yes or a no. Carl Bonamico. No. 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 Mike Berdinsky, yes. Craig Fishbein. Yeah. Rob Fritz. Yes. Mike Glidden. No. Bob Gross. No. Jacqueline McNamee. No. Chris Regan. Yes. Jesse Reynolds. 
Yes. Amy Walsh. Yes. Two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six yeses and four no's. Bernadette, were you also counting? Yeah. Did you get that same total? So that carries, and if that creates a problem, we'll let me know, we'll put it on the agenda, we'll revisit it, and if we cause a problem for ourselves, we'll fix it. So, but for now, a quorum is six. Um, moving on to, to the ethics, I put that on the agenda because we, I thought we, any vote we take requires seven votes. So that motion failed. Right well, um, any action taken by the that's by the, that's a good that's a, so that's that actually a, that's a good point of order. So that so that fails. So what we'll do, and we may not be able to decide a quorum, in which case I will amend <laughs> my letter to the council. Um, is entertain a vote for seven because we had one proposal for six. I'm going to go for seven. That may fail too. I'll make a motion to make seven, seven people who are one. Okay. So Bob second. wrote, and uh, Jesse and Jesse Mike Glidden both seconded Jesse. that, Bernadette. Mike Glidden and Jesse Reynolds. Jesse. Give it to Jesse. It's okay. So, <laughs> He's fine. So, um, yeah. We're going to go around the table again. This is for the seven vote. Al Bonamico. Seven. That's a yes for seven? Yes, yes for seven. Mike Berdinsky, yes for seven. Craig Fishbein. Yes. Yes for seven. Rob Fritz. Yes. Yes for seven. Mike Glidden. Yes. Yes for seven. Bob Gross. Yes. Yes for seven. Jacqueline McNamee. Yes. Yes for seven. Chris Regan. Yes. Jesse Reynolds. Yes. Yes. For seven. Yes. Yes for seven. Amy Walsh. Yes. That carries. Okay. So moving down um, to, to the to the ethics, um, because we're because we're handling so much money, I think. It just deserves a spot in the agenda at, a, at an early at an early meeting. Uh, I'm not here to answer you know technical questions or give a lecture on the code of ethics or the charter or anything else. But what I did want to do is to sensitize people to some of the complications, and we're going to do that by going through some documents. And I think Mike Lynn is going to uh, start screen sharing. Um, and as we go through the documents again, not to answer any specific questions, but so, but, but to give the public confidence that we are aware of the code of ethics, we're aware of some loose concepts, we're aware that it's in the charter. And if anyone feels they you know, have an issue, the answer is not to come to me. It's really to uh, call up the law department and get their advice as to how to proceed. And maybe they would call you in and go over it with you, or refer you to uh, the ethics commission for an opinion. Um, but it's important, I think, that the, that the public sees and understands that we're taking the issue um, uh, seriously. And going back to something that I, that I said before, there'll be a point in December where we're gonna see maybe hundreds of names. They are applicants. And my, my hope is that as soon as you see those names, scroll through them. And if you, um, if you sense a possibility, hedge number one, a possibility that there may be, hedge number two, a chance, that the public will perceive your voting as something that isn't quite right, then take the action you need and get that squared away. Um, and you know, my first choice would be go to the law department and and get that and get that worked out. Um, the earlier you do do that, the better it is for everybody. So we don't have you know a struggle on a vote count or a quorum or or anything else. So. As a screen share, Mike, um, can you get the charter? Get chapter 
21. Chapter, chapter 21, and it should pop up. It's up right now. The language that I wanted to draw your attention to is under B, conflict of interest. And it said, we're not an employee, but holding at a point of office, an argument could be made that we're officers. Therefore, we shouldn't have any interest financial or otherwise, or otherwise. A lot of people think, well, conflict of interest is you get a cut of the action, you get a kickback, you get a, you know, a dollar benefit, not true. It's a, uh, an interest financial or otherwise. And then the next two words, three words, direct or indirect. Very definitional, depends on context. You know, let's not talk of you know, what's an indirect or direct tonight, but you have a non-financial interest that could be indirect and you're right at that line of violating you know, the, the, uh, the charter. Moving down to the second paragraph, um, if you know that you have or will have, you're supposed to, a conflict of interest, you're supposed to disclose that in writing to the chairman of the commission with a copy of the Board of Ethics. Um, you may decide to recuse yourself whether or not it's a strict, whether or not it's a technical violation of the code. You may decide the best practice is to recuse yourself, in which case it's not a conflict, you're just recusing yourself. Did, did I confuse anyone with that statement? Yeah. Just procedurally. Yeah. So it appears there are two avenues when a contract is submitted that, uh, well, let's say my business was in a contract. That's the scenario. Application. I, an application. Yeah. I could recuse myself, which takes me totally out of whatever, or I can move forward on that and disclose in writing to my supervisor. I'm taking this literally. I know. I'm, I'm, take, I'm taking this. Uh, I'm taking this literally. If you know it's a clear conflict of interest, whether or not you recuse yourself, you have to disclose. It. If it's not a conflict of interest, but you think you should just get out of the debate, then just recuse yourself. If you don't think my answer is a good one, see Janice Small. Mike, could it maybe that's my maybe my make it, could I just say what I what I yeah. tell my commissioners? Sure. Um, is is you hit the nail on the head. Perceived conflict of interest is the worst thing to handle because no one understands your background or knows why, you know, whether or not you're actually connected to whatever web. So first off, what Mike said, if you feel uncomfortable, recuse and leave the room. You don't have to give a reason, just leave. If you feel that it's not a that it's not a conflict of interest. What Mike said, the two things I would recommend is talking to Janice Small and also informing Mike that, hey, you know, like Greg, my business is, I may, you may not own it, but you're employed by the business. They're submitting a, a, a application. I'm not sure. I'm not a uh, officer of the, uh, the corporation. However, I do have a financial benefit to this application. Janice, what's your opinion? Is it really a conflict that I shouldn't be here? Okay, then I won't be here. And the other thing too is when we get into those situations where you have a conflict and you feel you have to recuse yourself, the, the big advice I give you is that you need to leave the room. Not only just physically say, I'm going to recuse myself on this vote, please leave the room. Well, we'll, because yeah, we'll, that's another perception that you may have recused yourself, but Mike Lydon sat right here and scowled at you while you guys all reviewed the application he was benefit, uh, benefiting from. I may may not have voted on it, but I influenced your decision. I'm not sure. Gonna, I'm not sure. Gonna, yeah, I'm not but sure. It gets, go it that gets far. down to perception. Unfortunately, it's really gray. Um, sorry, that's all right. That's um, my life. Day, day yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's go to the next document, which is uh, the code twenty dash one. So, so the language that that I highlighted. By the way, this is not the entire code. This is just two sections, right? And the entire code I emailed to you because it's a requirement that you all get it. But this is just two sections. So um, the concept of the code of ethics explained in, in that 20.1, it not only, it, it talks about the very last clause, generally accepted societal norms and conventions for proper and ethical conduct. That's the context in which the code of ethics is applied. What does that mean? You figure it out. I mean, but this is the spirit of, of it. And as we go to 20-2, uh, I'm picking a clause in the middle of the paragraph 
Um, you know, the, the purpose is to have independent, impartial people judging millions and millions of dollars, you know. But in the middle, it says that the public have confidence in the integrity of its government. And it's also the context in which a code of ethics uh, might be applied or a, a said supposed alleged violation. Um, I just bring that to your attention because we should. Next document, Mike, is uh, interest. We'll get off this, just indulge me. I, I feel I need to do this. So just indulge me, we're almost at the end of it. No, yeah, one before that. Said that. Sorry. Here we go. Yeah. So this is a definition of interest and just about everything in the code of ethics has a definition and you read the definition and your head spins, like what does it mean? Uh, some of it is vague, interpretational, I and mean, you just can't always tell. What it, what it means. Um, and here, an interest is defined, again, direct or indirect, financial, it's an interest that could have a financial or personal value. Can I move on? I mean, whatever, what does that mean? I mean, if there's a doubt, check it out and, and get an opinion. And if there's still doubt, it probably is, just recuse yourself. I mean, resolve all doubts, and I think. Resolve all doubts um, by recusing. B, under, under interest, um, at the last line, if you have a conflict of duty, divided loyalties, exam the best example, you're on the board of directors of a nonprofit or a business. As a board member, you owe a duty of loyalty to that business or nonprofit. That's a duty, but you also owe a duty to this commission and the taxpayers that's divided loyalty, you're out. Um, sometimes that's not well understood. Okay, um, I would really like to move on unless we are, okay. So let's move on down the agenda. And see what we got. What did I say? Yeah, okay, the process, the process. I did not want to take a vote tonight on anything regarding the process, but what I did want to do is to raise issues so that when the applications become public, the number of applications, the gross amount people are looking for, your thoughts will have begun to get collected as to how we're going to address all these applications looking for all this money, just, um, just start to think about it. That's all I'm trying to do with this agenda item, start to think how it might happen. Um, because I don't want to, um, I want to use the dead time we have to take care of these procedural things so that when um, it comes time for us to deliberate, we're not wasting time on procedural issues. And the dead time is now to December 9 at five o'clock because the applications are still out. And then um, the consultant collects them all. We don't get them. We discussed that, I think, the last meeting. We don't get them. Consultant gets them. Consultant looks them over for whatever the consultant does and then releases them to us. So that might be the following week. And then I hope we all begin to look them over and get an idea of you know, the amounts and, and what they're all about. But eventually, and maybe this is gonna be in January, but we're gonna to get to the meeting dates in a second. We're gonna to have to decide, okay, how do, we, how, do, how do we score these? What are we supposed to do? What's our mission? What's our role? Um, and the way it's been laid out, uh, we take the applications, study them at home and don't read them for the first time I'm lecturing on it. When you come to a meeting, it'll take forever. It'll be June if we do that. And we come to a meeting and we start applying the criteria, which we didn't make up. It, the council approved the criteria. That's the hand we're dealt. We apply the criteria to the application and we assign a score. And that score um, 
is pursuant to this evaluation criteria. I hope your eye fell on it. We can get it up on the screen, although it's like page five or six of a, of a larger document. I'm talking about this little one from Janice. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it'd be good if our eye fell on that. So the, while Mike is finding that, let me just, so for example, Which one? I That's fine. Nonprofit is good. Nonprofit is good. In your packet, you have buried deep is an, the nonprofit program proposal application evaluation form. And you will see that there are one, two, three categories that we are going to assign points for. And how we do that is we're going to talk about that tonight. We're in a, you know, a rough draft. This is a rough draft tonight, how, we, how that works. The first row in that application says, does the proposed project, I'm reading right from it, uh, the proposed project will address the negative economic and or health impacts due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no score there, it's pass fail. So part of what we do is we're gonna have to decide whether there's a pass or a fail, and that's going to be a vote, depending on, you know, uh, that'll be a vote. If it passes, then we begin to try to weight the points in each of those categories. And I'm thinking that the way we come to an agreement on that score because it's not going to be, we're not going to get seven agreeing on a score of 93, um, is that we agree in advance to average those scores. And we'll have to have a, you know, an adding machine and a tape and we'll just make sure the scores are right. And with each application, we discuss them, we score them, we put them down, you know, on the score sheet. I'm thinking for a paper trail, maybe we hand in our score sheet. I'm not really sure how that's going to work, but I, I'm most comfortable with that. Um, so if there are 200 applications, there's 200 scores. And I'm thinking you date them, you sign them, we read the scores into the record, someone adds them up, we come to an average, and that applicant, let's say, hypothetically, has a score of 82. Another one has 79, another one 93, another one 86, just depending on your judgment, your discretion, how well the application matches the criteria. And everyone's gonna have, you know, 10 of us here. Everyone's not gonna agree, but that's okay. I don't think we have to agree on, on the particular number, but everyone will put down a score, we average them out, and eventually there is a tally. And we have to agree on the amount too. Some may be easy. Some of the amounts may be easy, others may not. And then we have to decide, okay, we have a list, a ranking, you know, with the best to the weakest. What do we do with that? How do we, how do we figure out the cream of the crop? Uh, is there a functional difference between a score of 89 and 91? Should there be a monetary difference because of that? You know, I'm thinking not. But we could, we're gonna go around the table. I mean, I'm gonna take a drink soon and take a breath. But I'm thinking that we average the scores, when all the scores are, are done, we had predetermined what the first tier is of strong applications that should get what they asked for. I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it that way temporarily. Maybe there's a second tier, which is more questionable. And maybe there's a third tier that is, oh, no, those, those are too weak to, to award money to. But if we do it that way, we have to determine what the cutoff is, let's say, hypothetically, 85 to 100 is that first tier, really strong. Um, documents are in place, they get their money. The second tier, 84 down to 70. And depending on how much money we have, we say they don't get it all, or maybe we prorate it, there's problems with that. Um, but it's that kind of a system. Um, how do we separate the wheat from the chaff? Or is there so much money and so few applications, everyone can get everything they want? 
We won't know that until December. And that's why this is a hypothetical kind of conversation. Um, we got to see how much money is available, which is coming to the, you know, another part of the agenda. So that's, um, you know, that's one, that's one model. I, I, I said proration. The problem with proration, it's attractive in a way to shoehorn the requests into a limited amount of money. Just prorate everything. I get it. That makes sense. The problem is if someone has a project, let's say it's a $25,000 project, and they may decide or take the position that it's not worth it to them to pay a dollar of their own money for this project. They're gonna do the project because they're getting 25,000. So if we prorate them and they only get 20, they may say, I'm not spending 5,000. And they don't accept the grant. And now our work is for nothing. Or that 20,000 unspent or unclaimed or, or the contract isn't signed, I gotta cover that. The contract is not signed. Maybe that twenty thousand defaults back into the pool, and we start all over again. And now we're into May or June or April or something like that. I mentioned contracts, so I want to talk about that. My understanding is that every application that is every applicant that is awarded money is going to sign an agreement, and I'm thinking that the application would be incorporated by reference into the grant award. We hereby award you, congratulations, greetings. You've been awarded $25,000, sign this agreement. All the promises, representations that you made in your application are hereby incorporated by reference. And if you don't abide, if you don't comply with your own application, we get to take the money back. I think the contract will say something like that. Same with nonprofits, businesses and nonprofits. So that's the business of the law department. That's not our portfolio, but that's how that's how things are going to work. I'm I skipped over a document, and I'm not going to ask Mike. To, no, I may. I think it's it's worth it to put that up, Mike. In the application to either businesses or nonprofits, it doesn't matter. But the last page has the last page of the application has the documents they're supposed to provide. And let's, geez, I'm on low battery mode already. Okay. You have on your screen, I hope. A list of dot, it's under financial review by consultant. The applicant will require to provide the town's consultant with the following. Audited financial statement. IRS forms for 2019, 20, and 21, if required to follow. Any other financial information requested by the consultant, then I asked the consultant over the phone, that means us, right? He said, yeah, that means us. So along with the application, we have the opportunity to look at their financials to see if it all makes sense, consistent with the criteria. You know, we're got to stick to the criteria, the written language on that one page. So I got kind of got off track, but the documentation goes along with the application, which we rank, which we score, which we're going to have to somehow determine. Is everyone a winner? Or some people, they get 100% of what they want and everyone else with the weaker applications get less. Um, that's our, you know, that's our challenge. Um, but I want to stop and take a drink and get some thoughts from everybody. Um, and who wants to take the first swing as a reaction to what I said, a suggestion to how to proceed, anything. And we'll just go clockwise around Craig. So I agree with everything you said. Um, I think it would be appropriate, since we are a body of 10 with all different scores, to average those scores, but then to round off. Um, I think that would be the most efficient thing. And then it gets out of the 89 to 91 situation. It becomes a 90. You know, so the 91 to 89 would score the same. Um, I think that may be the appropriate way to deal with it. Um, I agree with the tiering, you know, the 85 to 100, you know, they probably get the entire grant they're looking for. And then 
then you know something lower than that. Part of the problem with the scoring, though, is and we brought this up at the last council meeting, and it kind of wasn't resolved. Um, Mike, my, my, you bring up the other sheet with the 50, 20, 25, 25. For the business? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's possible for an applicant, not a full committee. Let me get the summary sheet, sir. Let's see. Yeah, on this one, it's possible for an We lost Mike's feed. until you get back in. So my computer right now is the microphone. Picking it up. Okay, so I can talk? You're talking. All right, a little technical glitch. Um, Craig, what you say illustrates the complexity of all the things we got to discuss. I mean, all those models. But ideally, uh, at a meeting in December, when we, when we see the applications and the amounts, we will take votes on, the, on these kinds of concepts. But I wanted to start the ball rolling mentally is the you know the most rational way of doing. I'm going to go around the. I want to. I want to. Mike, maybe just to follow up with some of Craig's points, I think they're important. Um, suggestion, you know, and not to commit. You're interrupting my round of paper. So let, 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 let's go around, and then when it okay. comes to you, then okay. we can. Okay. So, uh, uh, Rob, I think we need to simplify this so I don't disagree. I agree with you. I don't disagree with your premise to average the scores. Um, you know, uh, Craig, your suggestion to round off is, is reasonable, but then again, you know, anything over an 85 that rounded up to 90 is, or you know, 89 to a 90 is one thing, is an 85 to a 90. Um, I think that needs to be discussed. To be discussed. Yeah. 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 And I also think that, you know, I, I, I think totally agree we need to get a lot of these processes out of the way before we get to the activities, but then again, Things may change if we get 50 applications, you know, and so we have to also not be careful to be careful not to get too far ahead of ourselves to your point. But it, it, basic, you know, I agree with the premises that you said we have to have something that's going to be efficient and economical uh, in case we get a lot of applications and it's fair. Yeah. So, and I like the idea of averaging people that way. The last thing we want to do is start to go and nitpick every single application. Nobody wants to get into those types of discussions. So I think that by averaging them, I think that's a fair, it, it's all going to be weighted. I think that's a fair way to go. Chris? So uh, the, the first question I have is are these applications final and set in stone? Are they, I'm sorry, are, are they final and set in stone as far as the scoring mechanism and as far as the criteria that they have set for? Let me answer the first part. The applications are set in stone because they're out there. They're right. being filled in right. as we talk. As far as the criteria, no one quite understands the mystery of how the town council works. So until we start, forgive my playfulness. So until we start cracking the envelopes and deliberate, you know, sitting down at a meeting and deliberating, they could change the criteria and then and we start all over again. Not all over again, but I mean we could. So is it this body's job to perhaps recommend changes? Or I mean, we can just go ahead. 
go, I, I, and it's trying to turn to, there are a number of holes in these applications, not just storms um, in, in that. So if it's a situation we are bound by the guidelines and some of them require matching funds, some of them will require contract or availability. You know, and easy zero uh, in, uh, in category two or three is very much there. Nonprofits may be looking for uh, matching grant money in order to set some of these things going forward. You know, how do we evaluate the package in general with the scoring system in mind, but also have perhaps additional points that can be added based on merit or based on some other set of criteria that we can set forth so that we can say you scored 75 50 for uh the first category and i think there's no question as far as that um you know that's that's set in stone but the second two specifically for corporations uh, are a little bit subjective and or a little bit, um, you know, have that feature piece. Can we, you know, as a body say a 75, we can add five additional points um, or, or, or something along those lines, I guess would be the question. Um, we're going around the table. So that's the thoughts that come to mind. Everything every, will get their shot at. Um, I don't think, first, I don't think it's contemplating <laughs> that we have a role in restructuring the criteria and the applications that's that's gone, you know, that, that's up there. Good. Yeah, so the criteria. Um, I don't think that's contemplated that that we do that. It's kind of these are the cards you're dealt. However, if there's a strong feeling from this committee that the criteria are not workable. I mean, it's not that we would prefer something else. It would, it, I think it would have to be something more extreme than that um, because we're not the designers of the criteria. So our preferences, you know, that's nice committee, but it's not your job, but out. But so I think it'd have to be something more, my personal opinion, something more severe but if there is a, a feeling from the committee that these are unworkable, we would hold some meetings, all 10 of us, and we would redo it. And then we'd go up to the council and they'd do whatever they want to do. And, you know, maybe they maybe fine, they rubber stamp what we do, or maybe it goes into March. I can't predict that. Did I fairly address? Yes. Are you sure? Did I, I'm not sure. It, it's almost a wait and see what the applications actually kind look of, like. Yeah, it does. Uh, unfortunately, and you yeah. can't predict for every single permutation yeah. that will come out of these things. So maybe, maybe this is not something that we'll have to address. Yeah. Uh, maybe it is, and at the time we understand that there are some special you know, uh, criteria associated with X, Y, or Z's application, and we decide not to make the decision at that point in time. Put it aside. Uh, well, it, 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 let's do that. I think we have comment. I think I understand that there's some common ground. So we'll wait until that meeting in December. I will put an item on the agenda that raises the issue you're making. And we'll take the pulse of the committee and, and see where we're going to go. So we're not losing it. Right. We're not losing it. And it, it is a possibility, you know, that we make other recommendations. Mike Lidden, sorry. It's okay. Well, actually, to kind of follow up on Chris's point too. Um, so what I was thinking, kind of what Mike said earlier about, maybe we set a bar, let's say it's 90 and above. You score 90 and above, you get your money. You get what you requested. You're 89 or and below, and let's just say, well, we'll put it like 89 to 75. You go into the category of, well, you didn't really make it for the automatic. And then we really look at those applications and maybe that's where the use of interviews comes into play to see is, is this person, it, just like with Chris, Chris's point, maybe they scored a zero in one of those categories and they just couldn't put it to paper. The, um, I don't want to just, whatever section of, of, the, of our review. They come in and they wow us and you're like, wow, I, I, we got it in the interview. They may have gotten their application, but they were able to demonstrate it. Then at the same time, as if we, if we recommended what award, 
um, of the grant, you know, we also can tie the strings to what they represented at the interview, not just what's in their application, but say, in, in addition to, you may not have said, the, you may not have provided the following, but you indicated you're doing X, Y, Z things. And that's how we get it across that one across the finish line. I mean, and to Mike's point too, I, I guess you won't, we won't know until we start seeing what comes in. If we have 400 applications, you know, we may want to take that approach. That's similar. When I've sat on uh, panels for review of grants for FEMA, for BRIC grants, which is the Build Back uh, Resiliency grants, we, um, we review grants from all across the country. And they literally just put a, a bar way up at like 90. And they're like, you don't score 90 or above, you're not even considered in the next round. Your, your, grant, your grant goes to the back of the pile. And if that round is really small, then they go into that next little tier of which then FEMA would say, well, we may call you in for an interview, we may call for additional information. So it's food for thought. Because the other thing too, is that we're gonna have these applications for businesses, I think, you know, that are gonna have one, one aspect, which are limited to $25,000, but we also have not-for-profits where some of the requests or services, it may be tough to put to paper where we may have a lot of these situations where Chris is kind of alluding to where the criteria may not really grasp what they're requesting, what they're planning to do. So we may end up having to need that tiered approach to say, get the easy ones out the door, the ones that we're just not really sure, they come in for an interview. Um, I agree. I like the rounding up. I like the more. And, um, I agree with the interview. If there's um, some questions, obtain some more information. Yeah, I want to hold off. I mean, the interview is a separate item, so we're going to circle back to the to the uh, interviews. Amy. Um, yeah, I have some questions on the evaluation point. Maybe one has a most recent one. The nonprofit one has sixteen point five point five, and the business one is sixteen point five. Or is that on purpose? It's on purpose. And then um, on the business form, it says uh, approach timeline for completion of reasonable project can be completed in 12 months from when? From the granting, I, I think so we're going to have to discuss that. The non ones are from 10 to 31 to 24. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe 10 31, maybe 12 31, you know. I think we can clarify that um, at the time we award, but I think it's from 12 months from the award. Because they don't know they have it. So, right. until right. they get a letter. Then, yeah. Right. So, I mean, when we're talking on the table, our idea of 12 months might be different from mine, might be different from yours. Because everyone um, has to be on the same page as far as how it's that's an administrative thing. Once we issue a report that these are the applicants and these are the amounts, it's out of our hands. And administratively, someone calculates the 12 month time frame. But I will make a call before our next meeting. We're evaluating based on, yeah. you think it's going to be completed in 12 months. So I might be thinking of a different 12 months than. Right. Okay. I, Point will take. So getting back to the procedure of things. Uh, we have, if it was not there, I'm going to be prorating. I don't like the idea of prorating because it's hard to complete it. Some projects you need $20,000 projects. I like the idea of funding all or, all or nothing. I do like the idea of having a cutoff at some point. Um, I do like the idea of averaging and rounding off to near one five. I think we round off to near ten, but I think those are the one or five. Um, there was a question about Profits and I think any commitments for matching funds and um, nonprofits are used to providing letters of intent and things like that to show that they have the support, um, you know, to do the audit this grant to an extent. Um, and I do like the idea of setting a bar and, and also setting a bar of you know, nine years above or whatever that is and getting money out the door. I think that shows that we are, you know, making progress on this project. Um, and then if if it's less. I would advocate for having just interviews or just emailing back and saying, can you be more specific on your budget or whatever the issue is, whatever the most efficient way to get them to fix their problem um, is, is the way I would advocate to, to help people, you know, maybe their budget isn't well thought out. Um, you know, there was something, a little thing that we discussed. So, um, yeah, I like the idea of having a, a line that someone has. 
Huh? I'm going to agree mostly with Mike Lennon. I that's what I was, um, and Andy, the set of our, if their application is spot on and does everything, move on to the next round. I mean, I don't think we would worry the line. It goes back to the council to make those decisions. So it's just that we approve, we approve that application. I, one thing I heard was <laughs> that some app, I think that if an application is bad, they don't, there's no award. Not every application is going to get awarded, I would think, from within the room. Because you were saying, like, like that when it gets down, like, uh, for this case, that they'll go to the next round, but they'll get something. I don't think that everybody should get something unless their application is warranting them getting something. Because this will just permeate the thing where people just send an application thinking if there's not enough applications, they're going to get something. I think that they should have a need and a reason for getting the, the money. And if they do and they show the need, then this group should authorize it to, for the council to get the money. I'm laying out competing concepts to provoke thought, not okay. that I'm taking a position. I understand. Because, I don't, because I don't, but that's just what I'm taking that yeah. position that yeah. we, if there's only 42 applications on the business end and there's $3 million, I don't know what the number is in the council, but the $3 million, that's not going to take off $3 million. Not everybody, everybody could be awarded. But doesn't mean everybody will be awarded. They have to go through the criteria and fit in what the council has set up and move us to go through it. Because if it's a lousy application, there's really nothing there. And we shouldn't award anything based on the criteria that we set for. That's what I think. Everything else, I'm just going to agree with. You know, I got averaging, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I love the weighted average. Uh, it's just a, uh, we need to get a consensus on uh, what the benchmark has to be. I think we talked about the five or ninety percent or later. I've uh, I've worked through about two hundred and twenty-five PPP applications, and nothing is more important than discipline. And um, I would stay away from it having additional value uh, added on. And well, I think it's a great idea. And when it comes to this kind of process, it has to be very sharp and very specific. And uh, you start getting some subjectivity. That's where it gets a little messy. Uh, so I think it has to be very structured, very specific in terms of uh, numerics. Uh, I, I like credit proposal in terms of rounding up. Uh, that's important. So I think I think once you have consistency, proportion, and discipline uh, to these types of scoring systems, I think that's when you're not going to have uh, contesting or, or some sort of you know ambiguity in the process. Okay. Um, and in terms of if I can't imagine there's going to be a minority of, of those applicants. If someone scores a zero, if they have, if they're going to make the proposal in one of them, but absolutely, if they can't meet one of the criteria, I think they should be able to fall. So, no, uh, not moving to that process to the next stage. So, we're going to go around, uh, probably briefer comments this time, you know, rather than repeat, but we'll quickly zip. Yeah. yeah. So, I have a lot of problems with the criteria changing after the application are open. Let me address that. Yeah. The the criteria I got, is, I get is not. Um, I mean, it's a public document because it was approved by the council, but it is not anything that um, I would I would posit the applicants rely on. I mean, they can look at it. I mean, there's an application that they've got to fill out, questions they got to answer. So the problem so, that you run into is Jesse. Jesse would like to make some comments. Okay, we we'll forgot. Come around. We forgot about Jesse. Yeah, we'll come the problem that you run into is. Certain applications do not meet the criteria as presently issued. And then whether it actually happens, it is at least implied that the criteria is changed in some way, shape, or form to shoehorn those applications to meet that new criteria. And I do not want the public thinking that's how we're doing. It. So, so the criteria has, in my opinion, yeah. the, if, if this came before the council, let's just say to change the criteria. After the applications are open, I'm going to have problems with that. Yeah, that's that's an issue for the council. Understood. I'm now, that. yeah, when I was talking with Rob, the issue was not do we prefer another criteria? Is is these is this criteria unworkable? And if the committee felt strongly we should send something back, that would be discussed. But we can't change the criteria unilaterally. And if, if the council feels like you do, it's not changing. Frankly, I don't. I just don't want anybody to think that that is a viable avenue. I mean, 
the council has, and, and I, I have problems with the criteria myself. Um, and, you know, instead of having discussions about changing the criteria, the response is, well, you're holding up the process. So it is what it is at this point. Yeah. And you know, that's all. Um, we skipped over Jesse. So let's, Jesse, I skipped over you. Sure. sure. Get, get, get him. Get him. Um, are we good now? I'm not pinging. Can everybody hear me? He's okay. faint. <laughs> You're very faint. All right. One hundred percent. I'm trying. Here, this is my mic. Can you hear me better? No. Yeah. Can... All right. So, um, I think to Craig's point, since you just spoke, Craig, I think to your point, Craig, um, I, I think until we actually get the the applications, I, I don't really see that there's a problem with the criteria being evaluated and possibly discussed because we've not seen them yet. Um, as somebody who works in evaluation, I don't necessarily think the criteria here are clear. Like if you're gonna give this to me and give me an application and tell me to score it, there's no guidance here. Like there's a list of things that say, did this, did this exist, yes or no, and then provide a score. There's no qualitative judgment about it. And I, and I agree with the point about subjectivity, but this is all subjective. Like just because we put numeric values on this doesn't mean that it becomes quantitative. It's all subjective value. And so I have a problem with the evaluation criteria because you paraphrase what we're, it's too long. You can't. Okay. <laughs> Mike was Mike Berninski was asking you to hold off for a second. On me? Can you hear me? Yeah. No one could hear you except oh. for Mike Lidden. Therefore. No, we can we got an echo yeah, going. You could hear heard, yeah. everyone heard. I apologize. Only I couldn't hear. Keep going. Okay, so so my 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 main point here is that if if we're all going to take our scores and average them together, that's great. You know, that's fine. That's probably the best way to do it. It's the most honest way to do it. The other way we could do it is we could each treat our assessments like a vote. And if seven of us agree that a value uh, that a, an application is greater than a certain value, then that one goes through. That's another way to do it also. The reason why I, I'm, I'm bringing this up, though, is because if you look at the business application one, 60 points, purpose, goals, expected outcomes are clearly described and achievable, as demonstrated that the grant will assist the applicant in sustaining a viable business and is not a temporary fix. Those are six items. Does each one of them worth 10? Or is the last one worth 30? And the other ones are split up, but it become five a piece. Like yeah. it, it, it begs the question: like, how are we supposed to like look at each one of these? Because the applications themselves very clear, the intent of what we're asking very clear. I'm a little confused as to why one of them says that the consultant will look at the tax forms for one, but then we apparently get to see the information for people on the other. I'm not sure what that is. It doesn't have to be discussed right now, but in general. I find that the evaluation criteria for both of these are, is very confusing. And I think before we even sit down and try to discuss what kind of a, an 80 or an 85 and 90 or whatever, we got to kind of figure out how the heck are we going to come up with what a 10, what a 20, what a 30, what a 40 means? Because, it, I, you know, I kind of do this, I, I, I deal with numbers for a living and, 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 and I take this stuff very seriously. So I, I just... I'm confused on how the scoring process was developed. I'm not being critical of it per se, but being given the task to score things, I'm not sure that I understand it. And that's my biggest problem with this. Yeah, so let me, I'll mute myself. Yeah, let me, let me address some of what you said. Uh, and, and I don't mean, I don't mean to be dismissive, um, but if we are, given an evaluation form that is difficult to work with, we've still got to work with it unless there's a change and I don't see a change on the horizon. Now, do we all have to agree on the meaning or application or emphasis or multiple components into one category as you, as you just suggested? We don't have to agree on that. We just have to make up our own mind maybe on 10 different interpretations uh, of, of what this means and how it applies, we just have to agree on the score we're giving, and then they're gonna be averaged. 
But I think it's impossible to uh, say that, for example, Bob Gross and I have to agree on exactly what a component of a category means. No, we don't. I would recommend the opposite. He will score the way he thinks best, fair, based on the evidence, so on and so forth. And Bob, why are you doing that? Why, how could you possibly do that? He'll defend his case. We'll go around the table. But that ends. That pretty much ends it. Um, and we all are persuaded by Bob's way of doing it or we're not. Bob, I'm just using you as an example. That's all. And we each have a chance to say, here's why I'm giving this applicant only a 62. It is because of this, 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 and this. And, and that is how I hope the discussion goes based upon the preparation that we do at home. They're getting a low score because uh, Jacqueline may say, wait a minute, I read the same stuff and I'm giving them a high score. That's her view and that was my view. And we're just gonna have to put our own scores down and you know, average, average them out, whether there's rounding, you know, that's to be discussed. But I, are they confusing? Yeah, difficult to apply, yeah. And that's why you're being paid the big bucks to sit on this commission and do the best you can. Um, that's my reaction to what you said. I, again, those are the cards we're dealt. I don't think we can turn them in for a new hand. Well, well subject to Chris Regan's power to subject to Chris Regan's point that we made, you know, half an hour. Ago. We, we yeah. could empower you to bring to us what a, a better package, let's just say, that we could vote on and empower you to go to the council and say, we think this is a better way to deal with this. What do you think? So I'm just saying that is popular. You're, you're asking me to redraft the criteria? Is that what you're saying? Sure, yeah. yeah, you kind of are. Uh, uh, I think that's where do we leave off? I think we, we jumped to Jesse. Um, no, you skipped me. The process of going around again. Jesse. Hold on, hold on, Jesse. Carl, did you have your second shot at it? You did. Craig, you had five. Wow. I apologize. I was talking about attorney. No, do you, do you have another swing? At, at, yeah, no, no, listen, I, I agree I think that we need to be very structured. It is what it is to some extent. To Greg's point, I can always empower you to approach the council if you feel that, if some of us feel that strongly. Um, but you can keep peeling the onion as in, as forever. Exactly. And, and you start going down that rabbit hole. Somebody makes a suggestion, somebody's going to come for that. And next thing you know, we're going to be very frustrated. I think we all have to swallow our pride a little bit. This is what we're dealt with. And I think we need to just as you said, we can reflect, we're all going to weigh these differently. Instead of sitting here arguing about it or discussing each other one, we'll do it internally. And I think it'll all come out just fine in the end. We'll score it accordingly. And I think the right, the companies and the nonprofits that deserve the money will get it in the end, the ones that don't want it. I really think that's the way we'll go. Chris. This goes into the interview conversation. Yeah. And, and I'm and it also taking Craig's point if, you know, that we're not asking for somebody for further clarification. And, and thus allowing them to amend their application or provide other information that wasn't given them, that somebody else wasn't given a chance to evaluate or to, or to discuss it well. So I think this, and, and we'll get there in that interview section, but it's almost like we have to interview everybody or nobody. Um, I have things to say about the interview, but it's, I, I want to hold Sorry. off on that. So it glidden and then uh, Jesse Reynolds again. Mike. Um, I mean, that's an interesting point. Interview everyone or no one. I mean, I know we're. I know you want to talk about that later. Yeah. But then I go also. Ahead. But then, yeah, I might as well. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I put on my hat the the you know uh, when dealing with like a community block grant program, um, in an entitlement community, the way it works similar to this, word gets goes out whether it's a not for profit business they apply for funds that are available based on the action plan of the community, every single applicant comes before the, the action group and has a 15 minute to 20 minute, however they set it up, depending on the number of applicants, interview. And like, for example, if there's city of Middletown, they'll do interviews like four days in a row. Every night, we got a meeting at 5.30 to nine. We have you know, 25, 25, 30 applicants that come in. You have, you're hearing every single one. Then the, co the commission, reviews all those applications and determines after the interviews are done of every single applicant who is awarded the block grant funds in accordance with the grant. And, you know, everything's documented, et cetera, similar to this, this um, program. 
So, I, I mean, I said earlier that maybe that you use it as like a, as a separation factor, but then also there's the argument that maybe everyone, maybe everyone has to come through. And then the, then the comment would be on scheduling would be that we all have to agree there's going to be probably two weeks that we're to see each other three, four days a week as we're doing 20, 30 interviews in one night. Okay. Um, Waller for pizza. Here we go. Jesse, you're up. Um, I, 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 I'm not necessarily suggesting we change this stuff. And, and I just wanted to clarify my comments. My only, my only concern was that as, as somebody who's worked in evaluation of programs, I could see this going one of two ways that would be both bad. Either everybody scores 100 or everybody scores a zero. Because what we're being given here is a large number to gauge a series of uh, informative statements. And I just, to me, I, I, I feel like if we're gonna use this, then, then maybe my suggestion, once we get some applications in, is we pilot them and we do like an initial scoring where we take a random sample of, of like, say like 10 applications, we all go and score them. We come back to the table and we go over it. I know, now I know this is problematic because now we're gonna take actual applications, but I just, I feel like, I, I do feel like what we, we could end up doing is we could either end up denying a lot of people based on these criteria, or we could end up accepting everybody because when we average all of our scores together, it might be really hard for somebody to, to rate something as a 50 versus something that rates as a hundred. Like if you look at the, the nonprofit program proposal, if they get all of the 50 points for the, the first element, but then is it possible that that's the second and the third ones aren't gonna come up to snuff? Probably not. So they're probably gonna be somewhere between a 70 and 80, no matter what. And so that's my whole point. We're, we're weighting one category with a big score, which most of the information is just provided and then I guess we have to make some decisions. So, okay, so it's not a seven, it's an eight, or it's not a five, it's a six. But in the long run, when we average our scores, we're basically gonna, I feel like we're gonna be skewing ourselves one way or the other. Um, and I know that maybe it's not possible to do a sample because I guess we would already be looking at applications and using to test a rubric on it. But I, I would just feel more comfortable if maybe then before that, that at some point in the future, before we get applications, we could maybe come up with a little bit of an understanding as to how this is gonna be applied. Because frankly, if I was applying for this, I would hope that there was some sort of a consideration as to this, because it's very easy to, to dismiss all of it or to, to put scores on it, or to Chris's point, that sometimes they're intangibles that you don't quite get until you get extra information. And this might be a way of missing stuff that we might get at. So those are my concerns. I'm only one of 10. If everybody agrees that this is fine, I'll go along with it. I'm not gonna try to prolong a meeting, especially because I don't have a voice left, but. Um, that was just my concerns. Well, I think there's a lot of people in, in this room that have deep concerns. <laughs> and so I appreciate what you just said. And you're not alone. I mean, uh, you're, you're not alone on, on that. Um, interviews came up. So let me, we'll combine those agenda items. Let's talk about interviews um, for a minute. In, 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 in contracts and in programs and statutes and regulations, um, Ease of administration matters a lot. You can have, you know, the best regulation or the best contract, but if no one understands it or they don't have the resources to apply and enforce it, it's useless. So ease of administration, being clear, being simple, avoids a lot of problems. So what am I getting at? I'm getting at interviews right now. If we have hypothetically 200 business applications, do we want 200 interviews and what would we get out of them that shouldn't already have been in the written application so i mean i i would rather i would rather send a message loud and clear to those business applicants your applications better be good they better be complete they better be well documented because you get one bite at the end and we don't have time to interview 200 people to try to ferret out, you know, beneficial information as an appearance of trying to help you or interview people to try to undermine, you know, a claim they made. But we could, but just imagine how meetings are gonna go if we pick 30 applications out 
put them on the agenda. We prepare for 30 applications. We have 30 people come in. I can do that. I'm retired. I have a lot of time. I just don't want them repeating what is in the application. I don't want them saying stuff that they already said or going beyond their application and making promises or representations that should be in writing. Now, remember, this, if a business, and this applies to nonprofits too, a business comes in and says, would it help my application if I promised you this? And we all say, yeah. Well, that promise has to be reduced to writing. A memo has to be sent to the law department. And that promise has to be incorporated into the contract. So I'm back to why are we doing that? I've given the interviews a lot of thought. I'm going to come to nonprofits in a minute because I have a completely different view of it. But in, in thinking about the interviews, I, I would prefer a strong presumption against individual interviews make the application good, strong, and thorough, and we're gonna assume you put your best foot forward. And if your best foot is not very good, there's consequences. So it's, it's, it's largely timing. How much time do we have to hear somebody repeat what they've already put in or make promises that they could have made in the application and they, and they didn't? Um, on nonprofits, it's a little different because potentially there's a ton more money involved and you increase more money and maybe due diligence goes up and you want more clarity and more details. And I talked this over with Jana Small uh, and said, you know, if, if we get mega applications to be defined by this committee, whatever the cutoff is, whether it's more than 100,000 or more than 200,000, and we invite them in because, um, because programs, nonprofit programs could be more detailed, they could be more complicated. I, mean, I don't know, I don't know. I, would you be here to sit at the, at the meeting and to make note of representations that belong in the contract that did not appear in the application? Maybe there's a million dollars at stake. Due diligence requires you know, time and attention to something worthy of a million bucks, a lot different than 25,000. She said, yeah, we got to do that. Or she would be willing to do that if, if we wanted. So I make a distinction and part, part is based on time that we have, I don't know, 30 nonprofits. Is that too little? I don't know. I can see 30 interviews. I can see that. And I can see them taking half an hour, 45 minutes each. Oh, you ready? Are you ready, boys and girls, for this? Are you ready? Okay. I, I mean, I am. I volunteered for this committee. I'm willing to do it. But 300 or 400 interviews, I don't know. I'm not certain on that. So I'm morphing the interview thing and we'll go around the table as many times as we need. We need to, the next time we meet, hopefully we can make a decision on do we want interviews or not. Um, Jack, am I ambushing you by doing you first, but I'm going clockwise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I feel as though, yes, the applications are going to be subjective, and I believe that, that they're going to be subjective based upon the information, you know, that the businesses or the nonprofits provide. If the information is there, like Carl says, then yeah, the higher score, and it's going to be average. Um, I agree that I think businesses, you have one chance to give us the information. The nonprofits are more of a subjective thing just because there's so much underlying information. What I'm hearing is you're more open to interviews for nonprofits. For nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amy? Yeah, I don't know if this is selection bias because of how you presented it, but uh, the, uh, there will be more business applications than nonprofits. Business applications are $25,000. So, how much time are you going to spend on allocating $25,000 for business? Um, so, I agree that. They've got, they had a, a webinar, they had the doctor accountant who can make the best pitch possible and proto the best, and we look at it, evaluate it, and then throw it back. So I guess I'm leaning towards not doing interviews for businesses. Um, nonprofits being more um, complicated proposals, larger proposals, um, fewer. So, yes. Um, Half an hour interviews, I think it's really long. We could set a time. But we yeah, can decide. Yeah, we can I decide that. I think you can do it in 15 minutes, you know, if you have them. 
Yeah, we can work that out. Yeah. Bob Gross. No, I'll concur. I'll go along with that. Taking a pass? Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah, okay. Carl? I agree with uh, what you said. I mean, it, unless if your application is not well prepared, it's solid, uh, it, doesn't, it, meets, it does not meet all the eligibility requirements. I don't see being realistic, honestly, to have all these interviews. It could be 250. It makes absolutely it's not sensible to do that, honestly. However, if some of the complexities of the nonprofit requests, yes, I can see that certainly keeping it to a short duration of 15 minutes. We don't have to call them every nonprofit. That's right. right. Let me let me address that um, for a minute. Or do you want I, to I, every nonprofit? I don't want to paint with a broad brush or generalize too much, right? But um, I want to avoid the appearance somehow that we're picking on somebody or boosting somebody based upon who we invite in. So my preference, and I'm just one of 10, is to set a, a dollar amount criteria. Presume if you're over 100,000, you're coming in. Okay. Presume good. under, you're not. That's what I'm say. Something, like, that's something cool. like that. If Marcia Dimes comes in and says they want $10,000 to do this program, and it fits all the, all the criteria, why would you call them in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, where are we, Craig? So I have a lot of problems with interviews. We're both. I understand the concern that we're dealing with a lot of money with the nonprofits. Uh, you know, we have problems with the time period. Now, you say 15 minutes, and we got a bunch of questions. Go over 15 minutes, right? And then, and then it's well, mine was a half hour. Yours was 15 minutes, and you know, you got the money. I did. You know, you get to that stuff, right? Yeah. Another thing is keep the damn lawyers out of the room. So, do we say? And I'm a lawyer, so I didn't say. You know, <laughs> Make sure it's the minutes. Um, you know, is, is <laughs> that if the booking to get $200,000 allowed to send their representative without them coming into the room and then, you know, the lawyer being left with a, well, let me check with the client sort of stuff. I don't want to get into that situation. So, you know, that happens when we, you say you're going to have interviews. Somebody's going to hire a lawyer to present their application to this body because they're talking about a lot of money. I don't want to get there. We can we can um, we can decide that uh, at the time we make a final decision on interviews, and the interviews would be by invitation only. Either you're on the invitation or you're not. We could consider that. So it would be to Mrs. Smith, not Mrs. Smith's lawyer. But we can discuss that. That's a good point. Mike, yeah. Yeah. Listen, I totally yeah, I am. I strongly oppose getting into this interview. I, I guarantee you, right? We've all been involved. Give somebody 15 minutes and it's going to be an hour, and it could be two hours. And nobody's going to sit there and kick them off when we get into some of these serious discussions. We've got people waiting out in the yeah. hallway to get their turn. Uh, and gonna, there's all going to be, we spent the first half hour of our discussion this morning talking about being fair, being transparent, having the um, no evidence or, or image or uh, potential or being in propriety in our conversations, I think you're opening up a huge can of worms. I think instead, personally, that you should treat businesses and nonprofits. They're, they're all grown-ups. Nonprofits, businesses, I understand the distinguish, distinguish between the two, but I think that they are intelligent enough if we give them the correct criteria that we need to fulfill, and then perhaps give the, make available some counsel or some uh, the consultants or whoever they need to consult to make sure that they are putting together a comprehensive proposal before us. And there should be, they have two, two months to put these proposals together. They can describe the complexities or whatever they want. I think you go into an interview, I agree with Craig, everybody else. I think that's a, a black hole and it's going to be a, a mess. Okay. And if you're halfway through those, those discussions and then you have 
people that you deny that are going to come back after you award all the money in front of the council. It, I, I think it's a very slippery slope. So I'm not recommending that. Chris? So is there a page limitation on their proposal? Could there be? I didn't hear it. Uh, page link limitation. Of no, there's no the applications. So our no. job to review the proposals on an individual basis is all inclusive to whoever it is that submits. Yeah, I mean it could be brief. It could be expansive. If yeah. you if you define the interview or we'll redefine the interview uh, and, and warp it a little bit into a one way presentation of what you are trying to accomplish by asking for these funds, is the proposal itself considered that way to speak to us and make your case, et cetera. If that's the case, then the interview process shouldn't be necessary for either the business or for the nonprofit. Uh, the nonprofits asking for larger dollar amounts will be the ones who can clearly articulate the need. The smaller businesses may not necessarily have that opportunity, but we're also asking them to provide audited financial statements, which a lot of small businesses are not going to go through a three, four, five thousand dollar activity in order to present those versus a receiver versus a house compiler, et cetera. So, you know, if we um, pass on the interview, we shorten the time frame. I think I'm in favor for no interview. Shorten well, what time frame? The, the time frame to complete this project. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and get there. So, you know, are, are we, you know, are, is the body strongly encouraging what your best foot forward in a proposal? Well, you should be doing that anyway. And does that not meet the need? So, for, I, I think, at least my opinion, is to stop the two way conversation because that goes down so many different rabbit holes, opens up for uh, legal, uh, variety of legal problems because somebody got asked this question and answered it one way. Or if you're 10 in line, you've learned from what the body's asking for you elsewhere. So, you know, we can strongly encourage, as does everybody, asking for money from a, uh, in a grant situation. Um, the proposals need to be strong, period. Um, anything else that hasn't been said? Yeah, I, I actually would. So we're going to, yeah. So I, I agree with Amy that I think nonprofits, the ones that are the larger requests should be in for interviews, period. Um, if we're going to waive interviews, then I'm of the opinion then it should be, the score should be at a 90th percentile, period, for everything. That's the only way you get money. Otherwise, your applications, your application does not qualify you. Get um, I mean, that's that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. But that's saying because, like I said, the, with, especially with the, you know, and I and I said earlier about the community block grant interviewing everyone. I didn't, really, I wasn't really supportive of that. Yeah. Jesse, but um, I, I just, I just that, like I said, I can't stress enough that not for profits, especially maybe the number should be higher, not a hundred thousand, but let's say 150,000, where they're they're really asking for a lot of money. I think in fairness too, when I'm a business owner and I've been rejected my $25,000 and I see that Bob Gross is whatever you're doing, you got $500,000, I'm going, well, how did he get that $500,000 and I didn't get my $25,000? It's gotta be the mask. Um, um, but it's just, it's, you, you know what I mean? I, I think when you're in those larger requests, we are going to get we're going to get questioned on this, and I think the larger request we should we should have that just like how we said earlier about the ones that go out the door. We just agree not now tonight is not the night to come up with that tier process to approach it. Jesse, you're up if you want to take a swing at it. I I, I um I appreciate the discussion and um, going last. I have the benefit of hearing what everyone said, so. I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with Chris that I think everybody should have to stand up on the merit of their own application. Um, and because there is no limit for space and how, so you have carte blanche to be able to explain yourself to the best of your ability. 
and and you're right that I think people have the ability to do that if they're they're going through the the process. Um, but I also do see that I think the business applications because there's a cap on money, and the nonprofit ones don't have the same cap, and they're also different applications of the funds themselves. Sometimes, if you're asking for a lot of money to implement a program versus buying a piece of equipment for your business or something like that, if, if you can prove it to be that needed or whatever, I do think that if it's a certain amount, then that might warrant the need for interviews. Personally, though, I don't know how much time we would all have to be able to interview everybody, given the turnaround time that we have. So I think that has to be considered as well. But um, if we did have interviews, I think what we would have to do is create a structured interview packet where we come up with a set of questions and we only ask those questions and we do our due diligence to record the responses and we don't go outside of that. Similar to like when you, you know, sort of interview for union jobs or something where you have to ask questions that are relevant to the posting of the position itself and nothing outside of it because you have to be able to judge each one on its own merit. And that gets around the illegalities, but then now we're coming up with another evaluation form or a structured evaluation form does it have to go back to the council now do they have to approve what we ask people in interviews and so forth so I, I do think it opens up a can of worms so those are just my thoughts thanks for letting me talk yeah um hopefully this issue will become more clear when we actually see the applications and we go on you know the consultant forwards them and we see the nonprofits and our feelings may stay the same feelings may change someone else Wait a minute, let me just let me know. Bob. Yeah, two things. I, I agree. I think it's in the high dollar amounts, we should be interviewing somebody. We should be talking to them. Um, and I know you don't do, but the other person did. But UHY is doing this in other communities, and they're already done. What did, and I'm not saying that we would follow what they did, but what did they do in other communities to, what bar did they set? Because these applications aren't. They didn't do this. Um, a, I don't know. And B, this is our decision. Oh, I know it's our decision, but I'm just wondering what they did in other communities. If there's, and if they said, hey, this really worked out well, yeah. by interviewing people above a certain dollar amount, say, take Bristol forever. Ooh, yeah. The Bristol was a large dollar amount. They, they have 39 million or something. They did get the business as a not for profit. What did they do? It might be something that we could just work off of. It gives us an idea. That's all. I'm not, I'm not saying we follow what they did. It's not just that he did it. Did you me. sense I bristled at that? Did you sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you did. I saw the air up on your back when they said it. Anyone else on this issue? Yeah, yeah great. So, sort of dovetails back to where we started on this because if we say that a particular applicant is not going to have an interview, I would think it to be unethical for a member of this body to meet with any applicant and be influenced accordingly. They could do it to all 10. I mean, that still would be unethical if we're saying no interviews. You know, like I got a call from uh, uh, Maestro Ventry at the uh, Washington Symphony Orchestra. You know, I'm thinking of putting in this application. You know, he starts talking. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, we're not talking about um, you know, put in your application, look at the criteria, you know, so on and so forth. I, I think those conversations should not happen. Um, should be somehow precluded. There should be an understanding. We shouldn't be doing that anyway. Any conversation about any application should be in a group so that we all hear what it said. Um, I just want to flag that because I'm, I'm concerned about influence. Yeah, okay. Um, I think I'm going to move on to the next item here. Not okay. So, on the agenda number five, a resolution authorizing the chairman to request government to tell us how much money we're working on because we don't know. And it seems to me, without knowing that, it's very hard to make a decision on granting or recommending or reporting on, on awards. Um, there's something I skipped over that's relevant to this. Um, I asked a consultant 
could they provide us with a, a program, an app or a spreadsheet or something like that, where we can plug in the maximum amount that, um, that businesses are entitled to and nonprofits are entitled to. And that as we make recommendations for awards and we plug that in to the spreadsheet, the amount available pops up. So we know how much is left to spend. And as we go down, we see, we have a running total of how much we recommended and how much is available. Otherwise we could be making this up, recommending 10 million when we only have 5 million in our jurisdiction. So that's ministerial. Um, we don't have to use it. Uh, I see you shaking, Bob, but hold on. We're gonna go, I, I think this is just kind of a basic tool. Um, but it goes back to how much money is available. That question was never really clearly answered and that's gotta be answered, I think. And so what's, and I'm, I'm gonna, you know, after we go around the table as many times as we need to ask for a vote on, you know, on that. Um, does I, did I confuse anybody as to what I was gonna? Who wants to take the first swing at that, Bob? Yeah, I, mean, I agree that I think it should yeah. go back to the council. I think the council was kind of wishy-washy on the amounts. I think it was three and four million for each one of these groups. I don't know. We were accused of not knowing what we were doing. I recall. Well, I, for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand that <laughs> because I think that was the number for each one of those, and the difference with that. But that side of the point. Well, you and I were. Yes, oh, I understand. 20% of the group doesn't know what they're doing. Right? Guys. <laughs> so I think that's the amount. But the thing is, I don't think if you, I think that every application that comes in, whether there's money there or not for it, if it's a warranted application, they get the award the grant. It's up to the council to decide that decision. So if you've got 500 businesses that qualify for the 25,000 and they're all qualified, why, how do we pick which ones don't qualify? Or if you're getting down toward the bottom, you're saying, well, the person that we reviewed first got their 25,000, but now we're running out of money. So now it's only just 20. Yeah, that's how it works. That's exactly no, how it works. Now that's going to be prorated then. Now that's, that's not fair then to the person because we opened up theirs last. So here's my question to you. What is the harm in finding out how much money, let me finish. How, what is the harm in finding out how much money is available to us to award, let's say, to nonprofits? What is the harm in knowing in advance you only have, I'm making the number up, four million for nonprofit? What's the harm in knowing that? There's no harm in knowing that. Okay. But I'm saying we make the awards based on their application. If the council decides that they're the ones actually awarding the money, if, they, if we award, if they, Take the numbers, it's four million for non for profit, but we will work five million because based on the applications that came in, it's up to the council to decide whether they want to prorate it down to four million or make the they they can do what they or the mayor, they can do whatever they want with the money. And I think if eight counselors not you, were faced with that challenge, they would say that's why we have the committee. You really think that's why? Yeah. Carl, oh, are you done? Yeah, okay. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with you. I know, I know, and we don't have to. Reasonable minds, reasonable minds can do. Carl, I don't think there's anything wrong with knowing the running balance of what is left. I think that's important for we influential, maybe. But our job, as Bob said, is really to to score based on the criteria we've been given, and do that to the best of our ability. Um, I think, um, yeah, there's got to be some decision in terms of you know. Minimizing some of that, uh, some of those disbursements. So walk me through what happens if we, and I'm going to exaggerate to make the point. If we recommend thirty million dollars, divided fifty-fifty between businesses and nonprofits, we award thirty million dollars. No limit to what we can award. Walk me through what happens next. I think I think this committee has to make some voting decisions on the very best applicants in terms of you know, disbursements. Well, are you saying we sh should know the maximum amount we're dealing with or we shouldn't know? No. The remaining balance? Well, in order to know the remaining balance, we have to know the starting balance. Right. Yeah, that's, so are you saying we sh 
should know the starting balance? Yes. Okay. I, yes. I'm glad I nailed that down. <laughs> yes. So I thought we already voted, we being the council, voted to do 25% to businesses, whatever that percent to nonprofits, and then 50% of just sitting there, basically. Um, so that being said, I, I thought that was the goal. But I don't know that this body is precluded from doing its work without knowing that number, because we're just making a recommendation, right? So yeah. perhaps, we do say $30 million. This is our recommendation, $30 million. These are the applicants. We've approved these. This is what they've asked for. We've approved $2 million for Albrecht. So That's let me take issue. Let me, yeah. Some nonprofits. So let me take issue with you. So we go through March and we award, and we award $30 million and we send a report to the council of $30 million, even though maximum only $13 million is available. And they say, this was your job. Let's start meeting again in April and we'll go through June and we'll pare down, we'll pare down 30 million to an unknown number. And then we come up with an unknown number and it's instead of 30 million, we award 20, even though only 13 max is available for both buckets. And we give it to the council and they say, that was your job. And it is. I just think the way this has been going, yeah. that you're not going to get any. Well, that's on their that's on their dime. I mean, that, that's I, their I that's their that's their problem. And as to some vote that you may or may not have taken, we can't scrub the minutes. If it's if everyone agreed to it, it goes on the consent agenda. We get a letter and we say, "This is how much you have for businesses, and this is how much for nonprofits." Plug it into the spreadsheet. We have the starting balance and the remaining balance. Very simple. Well, but under that scenario, yeah. the math is such that you have this nebulous 50%. So I guess at the max, you could say that that 50% could be given out by this group. Craig, so I'm not scrubbing the minutes for your intent. I, I want a clean letter from somebody, how much money we have. No, I don't think you're gonna get it. Well, yeah, well, that's the decision we have to make. Wrong. I agree with Bob on the premise that our first task is to grade everybody fairly, independently, not based on when they're, when they, you know, they're all in on December the 9th. If somebody sends one in in, the, in November the 1st, they should not have um, preemptive uh, you know, access to the money for somebody that gave it to December the 9th. Unless we get, make their, unless we make that clearly stated now in the applications process, that you better get your application in early if and you have to take preferential. And that's not the case. You have till November the 9th. So everybody should be treated fairly. Our job is to grade each one on its own merit, whatever the score is, the score is. But to your point, um, I do agree that if, if we're going to award the money, um, we need to know, uh, be fair, if there's more applications. You know, I'm, personally, I think if we have a pot of money, three million, three and a half million, if, if, it, if it means that we have more applications that worth that $25,000 for in the business's case and exceeds the $3.5 million, we may have to prorate it so that they all get a little less, but that they all get something based on their score, because otherwise you're really uh, prejudicing some people over others, and, and I don't think that's fair. I think that, and I must have missed the, the, and my apologies, but I must have missed that line that nonprofits don't have a cap, so I... You don't. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't. Again, I again, we're, we're starting to get in this unequal equation, but the council did what the council did. I understand those are the cards that were dealt with. Uh, but to your point, we can't be awarded $30 million. Right? Is that prorating? Is that what we, is that what I would be suggesting? I know what the discussion I, I was going to ask you to clarify. Are you, Am I, do, my, do you want to know how much money is it? Available? Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. If we're awarding the money, I think that's, it would be good to have that information for sure. Right. But I, I still think that the applications need to be uh, approved based on the point system here. Oh yeah, no and one is- How much money is awarded, you know, you take a look at how many applications pass the test, pass the 90 degree threshold or whatever we set, and how much money they requested, how much money is available, that's, they won't have to make those decisions. So I, I just want to illustrate uh, with, with this example, if I, if I can. Um, 
each of us is going to th think slightly differently about this. And that's good. That's why we're all picked, because we don't all think the same. And reasonable minds can differ. However, would it make a difference on how you judge an application, knowing that there's a lot of money available, as opposed to there's not that much money available? Would it make a difference in how much you recommend to the top of the line applications, the, the middle tier, or the weaker, or, or would that be not relevant at all? Did I was I confusing? Well, no, I understand. Uh, I guess I guess it is a point system. It is a point system. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, uh, there is a pecking order in terms of you know. If, well, if, if we're going to do a pecking order, we had a discussion earlier that said, uh, I think Michael mentioned this, if we anything over 90 points, it would work whatever they request. Did I understand that correctly? Mm -hmm. We may not be able to apply that because what if we have 100 companies? All of them are above 90. Over, overnight, that's the problem. So right. to your point, I, I don't disagree with what you're suggesting. Then we have to have a point system on it. points. And we start the pecking order and we prioritize. And if we get to 83 points and there's no money left over, that's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, I don't disagree with that. I think that's probably it. Okay. Chris? First question is Are we recommending full funding, partial funding, no funding, or anywhere in between? As part of all of the above, purpose. all of the above. I mean, we could we could recommend. Let's let's say if I could inter interrupt a minute. Let's say there's an application. It could be a business. And let's say in three parts. I want to do A. I want to do B. And I want to do C. And it adds up to twenty five thousand. And we look at that application and we say C is really strong. B is hmm, A kind of smells. That's kind of stinky. We could award just C or B and C, we don't have to word the whole thing. Um, but if they say, I wanna buy an item and it costs $25,000, prorating it or cutting it back may mean they're not able to buy it. Are we awarding or are we recommending? Recommending, yes, recommending. And in that case, it could then, if we decide an applicant is deserving of 75% of their funds, but the council decides that they're only based on the number of applicants, et cetera, they're only going to give them two thirds of those dollars. They could, you know, and go down and further whittle away. You could, you know, so let's make it very simple. From my perspective, yes, in order to do the business of the committee, we have to have the dollar amounts associated. If we're given $100,000, not sure that that merited the amount of time that we've spent and are continuing to spend thus far. If it's in the millions, like I think collectively, I think it will be, you know, there's a big difference between a million, three and a half million, five million, or, or, or anywhere in between. So it kind of does us a disservice by not knowing that dollar amount of money. Um, putting together the package for recommendation of full funding or partial funding, whatever the council sees fit may be a better way to, you know, to try to allocate those and then the council decides, uh, you know, who gets it or who, who doesn't. Um, I think, my editorial comment, I think the council is looking for a list of names and a list of amounts. And that is, I think, what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to determine the amount of the award. Without knowing how much. No, 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 I'm not, no. We, if this resolution passes, we will know how much. They just, that was an oversight, I don't want to say. We need to know, they need to tell us how much money is available. They maybe thought they told us, but they never did. So every business applicant is going to ask for the maximum. The maximum. That, I mean, that's just the way it works. That's right. My, yeah, uh, I would do the same. Uh, and you, you get what you get, and you don't get upset. It's something I used to say to my kids to, uh, to, to go through this process. But at the same time, if I'm trying and I have to justify how and when those dollars are to be spent out to the penny, uh, 
not knowing what I have and having to come up with that plan after the fact in this contract. Just we're, we're, you know, Bob's not a, a, you know, a great point as far as get them all in. But at that point in time, it makes the council look bad if they're only going to fund half of them. You know, and is there a vote, you know, 100% funding if it, and, and maybe we do it on a storm basis. Maybe if it is 90 and above. 100% funding, if the body agrees, then that's what the recommendation is. And then we work on the, the rest of it, understanding and, and publishing that fund. Are you, uh, I want to get to the bottom line. Are you, do you want to know how much? Absolutely. We, okay, that's. That's the, that's the question. That's, that's the, the question. Question. Yes. Okay. So Mike Lynn and then Jesse Reynolds. So yeah, I would want to know the money, you know, the pot. What do we have to play with? Because if you actually think of it, let's just say it's three point five, and we're going to award twenty five thousand dollars for each business. It's only one hundred and forty applications. So once you get to one forty one, there's no money. And then we kind of look like fools because we have, we approved a recommended to the council one forty one go through the door. Because in the end, I mean, no offense, Fred, the fingers that you point to us because we reviewed it. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, actually, you're right. I can think where the figure is pointed, but um, but also for the not for profits, let's just say that we have not for profits that come in and ask for a lot. Let's just go average 200,000. It's only 17 applications that can go forward if we're basing it on the assumption of 3.5 million. So I kind of want to know what we have to play with before we start recommending applications to go out. Because, like you said, we could put it right in an Excel spreadsheet and just say, there's 3.5 million. Okay, every time we get another application approved, the you know that little 25,000 or whatever gets gets taken out of the reservoir, and then eventually it's zero. Um, and then we've done our job. Yep. Jesse, I, I think I think we absolutely need to know how much money we're going to be um, awarding, and and I I think that. Um, to kind of take it back to like the idea of how we sort of assess and score and what we recommend it. I, I think then it would be wise for us to think about like recommendations for full and partial um, because we would then be able to kind of look at more applications to Mike's point. You know, if we award just the full amount to anyone that scores over a certain threshold and we hit that point, we then can cut off a bunch of people that may also have scored and came in later or we just didn't have them in the pile as you know, so I, I think it kind of also, um, it's important information to have. I think we need to know how much it is. And I think we need to have kind of like a doomsday clock as to how that money's like going down as we, as we uh, you know, approve things so that we, uh, we have to contextualize what we're doing. Otherwise, to your point, Mike, yeah, we could approve $30 million, but we don't have $30 million. So um, yeah, uh, so I think we need to know how much money we're going to be dealing with. Okay, um, before I ask for a motion, I just want to, anything, you're up, Amy. Yeah, we're going to compilation. I, I guess I'm confused as to what our role is. So if our role is to recommend, then we can recommend millions and millions and it doesn't really matter, right? Because we don't, the council's gonna make the decision. However, if we're going to make a decision we need to know the amount of money so that it's it's not monopoly it's real money well i think if if this if this resolution passes and it, it would say something like you know please advise us how much money we are the maximum amount we are going to be recommending for both nonprofits and businesses the council could always say none of your business mm -hmm. Or it could say, I'm glad you asked that question. It's not going to be an uncomfortable debate, but I'm glad you asked that question. So I think that's how, you know, if the council doesn't want us to know, they could say, we're not telling you. And then we'll have a meeting and figure it out. <laughs> I mean, in theory, I, I think that we should know what amount of money we are working with for them. It seems obvious to me. I mean, and I don't know how I could proceed really without knowing how much because I could see it doing two or three times 
No, you got the number wrong. No, you got the number wrong. No, you got the number wrong. I mean, I don't know what number we're working. Yeah, so I, like Mike, I ran the numbers. And for every million dollars, twenty-five thousand dollars grant, it's about four people, forty patients. So yeah, that's that's the numbers. And the way I was imagining this is, we get the scores for everybody. We just don't rank the score everybody. But I would not feel comfortable having a cutoff of say ninety and get that money out to as quickly as possible because we don't know what the whole pot is because. You know, we can't work efficiently if, if we don't know what the whole month is. I wouldn't feel comfortable um, approving some people if we can't approve everybody. You know, so we say, here's the, if, if we don't know the total number, we would say, here's the rank order, allocate, have however, and so the money comes out, whatever the money is. Um, but then also, if they, if the council says it's 3.25 million or whatever the number is, and we say, wow, we've got you know 100 applications that we would love to fund, but we couldn't. You know, they can allocate more money. So you know, tell us what our number is to work with right off the bat. And if you want to add more later, great. Bob, Carl, Craig. I just, um, I totally agree. I mean, I think the number is helpful. I'm just, I'm concerned with what you just said because it's our recommendation is to say we could send 10 applicants, $100,000 each is a million dollars. How do you deal with the group that's just below? I guess that's a, it's a different question. That's why we're here. No, I, I understand. But then, you know, Amy's saying well, the council can, you know, look at those and maybe appropriate more money. Could. And, uh, and we're back in business. Right. Yeah. No matter, no matter what we do, there will be that cutoff, and there will be people that feel left out. That's why we make tough decisions. It is what it is, and uh, we have to just live with that and do the best thing to be as fair as we possibly can. But I, I agree with you, and, and our job is our listen, our task is to score these applications in a very independent and fair way, and then and, and, and it makes total sense to do it in a way that is. Um, uh, takes into account the awards that are going to be done, and then our job is to recommend that to the council. We're kind of doing a lot of that work for them. We can't, our job is not just to hand them a bunch of applications and say, This is the score, and let them figure that out. I think they expect more from us. I don't think that's what we're doing. Yes. So, is the order of evaluation first thing first out alphabetically? Uh, um, drop the hat. I was going to take that up at our meeting in December as to how we wanted to do it once we look at the applications. I mean, it could be um, alphabetical, it could be random, it could be any way we want to do it. But um, I would need to know so I could put it on the agenda so everyone knows how to prepare. It, it does play into the conversation, though, when you've got a pool of money yeah. of some amount and certain types of application that if they got there last and luck of the draw, potentially, then you're, you, you miss out. I think. Now, I that, 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 that just seems to me that's not what we're about. I think that's a I think that's a good point, and we're going to have to figure out a way that um, there is no uh, advantage to the people that come early. We're just going to have to talk about that in, in December. But I think if we look at what's coming in, but I would argue that yeah. the quality of the application right. happens to those who submit at the end and not at the beginning. I mean, that's what I do proposals for my business. If I have a longer time, you get a better quality oh. proposal. So maybe the answer is this to the applicants, business and nonprofits, take all the time you need, but no more than December 9 at 5 o'clock. Well, we've, been, we've, we've given direction that nothing is supposed to be open. That's right. That's right. All, all of them are confidential. So then the conversation is for the or yeah. consideration. And, and we've got to figure that out. Yeah. So, and it's easy to do it because the first job is just to score them all. Yeah. And that's, I've been on, on groups before like this. And then once you've got all the scores, you know what you have. So then the body has gotten a flavor through that scoring process of oh, these are the really good ones. And you know, these are the ones, the 90 and above, I really love those. And then a motion is made, you know, 90 above, I'll just give them the money. And then you start to drill down on, on the other stuff. And as you're doing that, you're subtracting from what you have. 
So you don't run into that situation where it's last in and gets prejudiced. Yeah, I, we're straying a little bit from what I want to accomplish on this agenda item, uh, which is do we or do we not want to know how much money we have to work with? And Mike, also, we're around to you if you have anything new. Just, maybe just a, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the chair to request the council and or administration to issue a memorandum clarifying the exact dollar much dollar amount per available for not-for-profits and for businesses. Yeah. You, Amy? Okay. Are we ready? Everyone got the motion? Carl? Can I just ask a question about because the motion was in the alternative. It did not say who that direction was going. Just to in from. case his, the, the mayor decides that you don't have the authority to say how much money, I want the administration. Carl, I, 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 I understand. Just just let's case, let's back right. up for a minute. Mike, could, could reread the motion. Could you reread the motion? A motion to authorize the chair to request the council and or administration to issue a memorandum clarifying the exact dollar amount available for business and not for profits. Um, so the way I put it on the agenda was government <laughs> because I want a one voice. I want to speak with one I voice. Understand. I understand. The only reason why I added like yeah. I said, is to make sure that you know, there's a clear set. We want to know the number. Well, I was going to give the this number. body hamstrung by that motion. Then I'll amend. So he's, he's I'll, the be. I'll amend, amend the, my motion and say the council. Yeah, I think you, that works better. Okay. Yeah. Strike the and, and or administration. Okay. Did so you, well, would you need a second? Oh, Amy, you're okay with that? Sorry. No, that's a good. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Carl, vote. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Mike, yes. Craig Fishbone, yes. Rob Fritz, yes. Mike Glidden, yes. Bob Gross, yeah. Jacqueline McNamee, yes. Chris Regan, yes. Jesse Reynolds, yes. Amy Walsh, yes. That carries with seven votes plus. Um, item six on the agenda, we, we talked about it earlier. Um, I make a motion authorizing the chairman to approach the council to figure out what we do with seven votes in this absence of urgency. Yeah, second. second. Well, I, just, I don't think absence is, I, I think it should just be recusals. Absences, I think, we can have, if for some reason, four people aren't here that night, that shouldn't uh, allow us to go forward and vote on it. But if we have recusals, people who row here is recusing us, or four of us are recusing ourselves because we all sit on a march of dimes or and they're before us, then that number has got to be down to a number. Well, what do you do with the, I'm not- Because I, we can do it from yeah. anywhere in the country because we're on Zoom. I, I understand. But I have faith in everyone who's here. Yeah, but I just want to throw out that absences can be used as a blocker. And I don't want to see that happen. So I think absences should be treated in the same fashion as recusals because I don't want something, some action by this body negatively affected because somebody decided to be absent. I've seen that happen with other groups. Um, and I just absent means not participating in the meeting remotely or here. That is right. correct. Okay, so they would not be participating in the meeting. <coughs> Someone just doesn't show up. Right. Okay, they they don't log in, they're not here in person, we haven't heard from them. But three of them not showing may negatively affect. And I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I'll go along with it, but I just would hope this group isn't. I would hope that there's no outside influence. I would hope that we're moving forward. And that here's the application. We're moving forward. Don't even care who the name is on it. Vote on it. I just hope we don't see that. I'm not going to hold it up for that. But I, I just my thing is on absences. If there's legitimate absences and we're short that night, I think everybody should have a say in it. That's that's my. 
Well, your, your sentiment is right. I mean, your sentiment is right. Yeah, absolutely. Dollars right. for um, March of Dimes. I'm just confusing March. You know, we can use a million dollars in March of Dimes. We have five people out here that night. I don't think that's fair to everybody that we're voting on a million dollar thing because it was on the budget that night for that to go through. And then only three have to vote on it, three vote, and then it gets a million dollars. Well, I guess we could agree as a body that if we don't have a certain number of people when we're doing applications, that no applications go forward. Well, let's back up. Hold, hold on one second, uh, guys. Uh, let's back up and we're covering ground we've already, we've already covered. If it's, a, if it's a tie, because someone isn't here for, we don't know why, they're not logging in and they're not here, We've already discussed that. It's probably going to come back. Um, I threw out the suggestion earlier that the concept that the council approved was that of a supermajority. That's what they wanted. An, an example is, um, for one reason or another, uh, there's only eight. One reason or another means they're missing an action and a recusal. So start with 10, we're down to eight. One absence. One recusal. We're down to eight. A majority is five. Four and four doesn't work. And a supermajority is six. So in that example, six would be required. And so on down the line. So if seven are voting, two are recusing, one is in the hospital and we don't know why, auto accident. Four is a majority, a supermajority is five. And that would be the gist of the letter that I would send probably with those examples and but your sentiment is well taken i want to hear from everybody because i i want to hear from everybody i mean it's so i think everybody's got the right to vote and if they're out for specific reason except for recusals i mean recusals are really going to there i would expect we're going to see recusals on most applications sure. and I you want to well that's why we have to flex a little bit when that happens yeah. Would vote no. Well, I understand. Uh, so, Craig, did you make the motion? Was a motion made? No, he right, I did make it. And who seconded? I seconded it. Okay. Your comments are noted. Appreciated. But what would you what would you suggest about that issue? You know. Um, I have no problem with it because I think. Um, no, as a resolution. So let's say, you know, 10 people show up to accuse themselves. Right. How would you like if you're the magic wand that to proceed? I don't have magic wands because I'm not a policymaker. I can live with what the council I can live with what the council did. And I could live with other things that the council did. This is not so offensive to me personally that I have to vote no or obstruct or something like that. But the problem is, is that you have one night where you have another applicant, say the next applicant. Yeah. Where nobody refuses them. Now that individual is set unfairly up against the one that did have the refusal. Not unfair. It, you know, it, you know, applicants, public, uh, council, everybody involved. Once in a while, you gotta people have to recuse. But life goes on and decisions have to be made. And if someone gets their feelings hurt, you know, I can call them on the phone and sort of explain the process, but. But in, in those two applications, the first application, the total amount of votes that the applicant could get is eight. So they would need seven, let's just say, to prevail. On the second application that has no refusals, yep. the total number of votes they could get is 10. So they have an unfair advantage getting across the finish line. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't character as unfair. It, it's a process that is is as fair and as balanced as we could possibly make it. Okay. And in, in, hold on, let me just finish my thought. I mean, it's kind of the best we can do living within the council's wish that there be a supermajority. And it's that supermajority I'm trying to implement without having unforeseen consequences come in like absences or recusals. That's all. Yeah. I'm, so I'm let, sorry. Let's throw this hypothetical out. There's only seven people here instead of eight. You need all seven votes. Similar to a situation if it was only four members of the zoning board of appeals. Now, in a land use matter, usually the chairman of the ZBA or staff would say, you need all these votes, all these members tonight have to vote in your application. If one person votes against it, your application fails. You have the option to wait for that fifth person to the next meeting. So I think actually this is worth getting a clarification on because they're going to be that that's the situation I think is, is, 
is difficult if you look at it from you only have seven people sitting at the table for recusals, absence, whatever, and an applicant's before us. Let's just say it's a not for profit asking for $500,000. That's a razor. I wouldn't want to be presented before this board. Or no. let's say of the seven, one of those recusals. It could be even that, too. Yep. So I think it's worth getting a clarification on this, but that, in that situation, well, the, the motion we're talking about is opposite <laughs> or recusals, a super majority of those voting. Um, Jesse, I don't think I, I may have ignored you. Or do you want to weigh in on this? You're good? You're good. You're good. Okay, that's a thumbs up. So let's, let's vote on this. Um, is everyone clear on what the motion is? Restate the motion? Yeah. Okay. To permit the chairman to approach the town council to discuss the issue of potential refusal and or absence of the second Did you say discuss? Sure. Determine. We've got to determine. Sure, determine. Yeah, because we need an answer. I'm not saying you're going to get an answer. Okay, we're asking. We're doing our job. Discuss. We're doing our job. Um, Amy, are you? Yes. Good with this? Okay. Alphabetically, Carl. Yes. Mike, yes. Craig. What? Usually on the council, I vote first. Well, I'm sorry. We, we do a better job. Uh, Rob, yes. Fritz. Yes. Mike Glidden. Yes. Bob Gross. No. Jacqueline McNamee. Yes. Chris Regan. Yes. Jesse Reynolds. Yes. Amy Walsh. Yes. That carries. Gross um, <laughs> I didn't hear that, but I'm glad I did. Let's move on. Let's move on. Um, here's a thorny one. Number seven in the agenda is meeting dates. Um, picture this. Consultant gets the applications, needs some time to go through them, although they're going to go through them as they come in. So they're not wasting time and waiting for January 10th, December 10th. They will release to us and you know probably at the soonest possible time. Um, let me get my calendar right. So the ninth is on a Friday. And let's say hypothetically, I hope you have your calendars out because we're talking specific meeting dates. So let's say we get them on the 15th of December. I personally want to spend some time looking them over. And depending on the application, is that, that could take some time. I'm not going to do it all on weekend. There's too many. And I want to have my thoughts collected so that when we meet the next time, we make some hard procedural decisions, all the things we've been talking about. That takes us into Christmas week. So the first question is, do you want to try to get this sig significant procedural meeting in before Christmas or in between Christmas and New Year's or wait until January. Let's supposing the consensus is people are going different directions, vacations and things like that. And we don't have time to do it before New Year's. I was hoping, maybe it's too aspirational, that we would set aside like the first two weeks in January for intensive meetings, like twice a week or something like that, maybe three times a week, depending on how many applications. So that, and, and the homework is significant. And so if I put 20 on the agenda, uh, <laughs> you need time while you're at home, your homework, just look at those applications, look at those tax returns, collect your thoughts, come ready with comments, questions, but keep an open mind so that we go around the table on stuff. Um, 
but I was, I was still hoping that maybe the first two weeks of January, we could wrap things up. And if we can't, then we maybe go to the fourth week of January, the third week of January, something, something like that. So the first question is that procedural meeting, when we talk about ranking and scoring and cutoffs and interviews and you know, all these things we're talking about tonight, December or January, that's what I'm after now that you know the calendar. Who wants to take a first swing at there? Ron? I would think you'd want to have a meeting before the holidays, if at all possible. Okay. That way, we, because there could be other circumstances <laughs> that we want to discussion, it gives everybody a chance to digest that before we jump into it again. So let me just get specific. Um, the are you saying, would you be amenable to, you're a December guy, that's what I'm getting, you're a December guy, the week of the 19th? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a light, so I don't go on vacation, I don't go to any time. Okay. So, I mean, whatever's convenient, there's a lot of other people in the room, but I'm just thinking I would rather, I think it's behooved us not to wait all the way until January to have that meeting. That okay. Meeting. We'll go around, uh, Chris? Agreed. Agreed? Mike Lynn? Mm -hmm. I guess the, the, the question is, what's our commitment from the uh, the consultant for uh, turning these applications around? What's what's the, the what's what's the time frame? When are, when are we actually going to see these things? Are they they saying like 30, 60 days? I mean, my plan is to tell them when we need it. Because once we decide, so this. I agree having the sooner rather than later having our our meeting to kind of iron out the details. But if you're saying that to wait until after we have the applications, if the, if the Cut off is December 9th, and they don't show us an application until January. We're wasting our time. No, 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 no. It, 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 this assumes this assumes they're going to release to us the applications the week of the I, 12th. So I would week prefer, of December. I would prefer because we're obviously we're gonna have we're gonna have special meetings. We're not establishing a calendar, a, a calendar with the clerk. I would prefer that we get a commitment from the from the consultant when exactly are we gonna actually receive applications before we start scheduling uh, a meeting. Well, regarding that, and I understand the time sensitivity, and all of us understand that, but I think that if we say we're going to schedule it in December and then come to find out we don't see anything until January, we've we wasted our time. No, that's that's an unacceptable result from the consultant. I, my plan, depending on how this vote goes, we'll get to you. We'll get to you. I won't, I would never forget Bob Gross. <laughs> never. I would never. I, depending on how this vote goes, I would send out a communication saying we need them by December 15 or sooner. So I would that's only, that. I would only support that if we have in writing from the consultant. And that's what we would get. Yeah, I would only that's support what we would that. Get. I will yeah. not support it, just scheduling the meeting. Okay, understood. Um, so assuming arguendo, so and I can, we can put that in the motion, assuming we get the, the, the application. In writing, yes. Assuming we get the applications by the 15th. Yep. Um, the issue, Jesse, is this heavy procedural meeting during the week, really, of the 19th of December. Or the 26th, or are you definitely stuck on the 19th? No, I'm not. Actually, we could go. We could go in between Christmas and New Year's. We could go. Um, thank you for that. So the divide is going to be on the 19th. Or the following week, or wait till January. That's that's the preference. They got it. It's not a vote yet. But that's... Jesse, you got some thoughts? Um, I, I, wanna... I I, I'm on. What's that? You want to wait till January, or or get it in before the new year? I, I'm I'm on board with what Mike said. I, I think it's contingent on whether or not we're going to get anything. Um, Assume window we're going to get them. Assume, assuming we get something i would i would prefer to do it sooner rather than later okay i wouldn't i wouldn't want it to be the week between in the holidays because i think that might be difficult to schedule for all of us that's um, our next so, discussion i just yeah. want to get december versus january then we'll nail it down to a date december jacqueline assuming we get the information in december amy yeah assuming we get the information in december bob and I, I agree December, but I, very funny, remember the Arbor Committee, the UHY drew up the timeline for the town. And it is on the 
website. It is on their website. I don't care. Okay, but it is on the website that we will be reviewing these in December. We're going to review them when we when we review them. I understand, but I think they implied that they would start having them right away to the, to the group. They, the, but I'm I'm just saying. But I'm I'm for December. December. That's all I need to know. Car. Assuming that we get the information from the consultants, my preference would be December, but from the twenty sixth that week. All right, we're going to this specific date is going to be the next discussion. So I just need a December, January preference right now. Um, it doesn't oh. make a lot of sense. To me. Craig? Yeah, I'm fine with December, but um, I, I will say that first week of January is problematic for me. We'll talk about that. I know. Maybe yeah, um, shortly. Others have both Rob? Yeah, no, I. Say, oh, you were right. Yeah, okay. Okay. So now, um, are there any January people? Everyone was December, right? Okay. So now we got to pick a date. And I propose Wednesday, December twenty seventh. I thought it was twenty seventh. No. Let's do it. Hold on. Who cannot make? I just got to tell up. Who cannot make the um, the week of the twenty sixth? Basically, Boxing Day, which is the twenty sixth. It's Canadian. In case you don't know, it's Boxing Day. Boxing day. Well, I can't Amy, do that Friday. But... That a week is out for you. Maybe the twenty ninth, but that would be Monday. Well. I mean, I'm ready to zero on the 29th as a courtesy to your preference here. <laughs> Can you do the 29th? Yeah, I mean, don't feel pressured. Don't feel pressured. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. My family's 500 miles away, so, you know. Okay. Um, but you could do a date the week of the 19th. Yeah. Okay. Craig, what was the date you recommended? 21st, but I know Carl is suggesting the 26th, but I just don't want to step on the um, I would like to make it personally uh, the, as late in that week as possible because I want to spend as much time looking this stuff over. And um, so if it was the 21st, who cannot do it? The 21st. Who cannot do the 22nd? Who cannot do the 23rd? That's Friday, December 23rd. So we're only talking about one. One night, one yeah, it's one night, but it could be. The twenty third gets a little. Is that Christmas? Yeah. Okay, we're back to the twenty second. Twenty first. Twenty first. Twenty first. Okay. So if we go the twenty second, or anyone who cannot do it the twenty second, maybe you can't. No, I could do the nineteenth, twentieth, twenty first. Okay. So I prefer the twenty first. Actually. So who who cannot do the twenty first? <laughs> You can't do the 21st either? No. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can do that. 22nd. Uh, yeah, 23rd, sorry. 22nd. yeah, okay. So I think we're on the 21st. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, that will be considered the 21st of December. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to tentatively schedule a special meeting of the ARPA committee for December, or Wednesday, December 21st. 6.30 p.m. okay for everyone? Sure. 6.30 p.m. Location, let's say town hall, room 315, unless- Or to be determined. Or to be determined. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's safe, actually. Um, Craig seconded it? Okay. Is that unanimous? Anyone opposed to that? So that's, that's unanimous. Bernadette. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, let's go to January. And this would be this is sort of technical. These would be considered scheduled meeting, regularly scheduled meetings um, that that requires cancellation. If we don't, eh, it doesn't matter. But I, I want this to be etched in stone to the extent we can make these dates in January. Um, 
who cannot make the first week of January for two meetings, the dates to be determined, you're away. You can't do it. Yeah, it's gonna be, I mean, I'm so away that I'm away, I'm flying back and I'm flying back. I mean, it's like, I've got a flight in the middle of the week. It's, it's a really screwed up week. Chris, I, did you, did I see you say you, you're not available that week? You are available. All right. Who cannot be there uh, at a meeting on the week of the ninth, January 9th, for two nights? So I have conflicts that week. I have a PNZ meeting on the 9th, and I have an environment commission on the 11th. On the 11th? Yep. Okay. Second, you, second week of the month is can you, the worst for me. Can you make the 10th, 12th, or 13th? I can. You can. I can. Flag, yeah. Yeah, the 10th. So now we're down to the 12th or the 13th. Okay. I can't. Now Friday, down. Fridays are Fridays are pushing it. I mean, I, I'm willing to do Monday through Thursday, but Friday, Saturday. I'm your humble servant. I'm here to please, but <laughs> I need nine others. <laughs> so we're on the 12th of January. Who cannot make the 12th of January? So January is the meeting. Hold on before we get any motions. So, so January 12th, 6:30. That's going to be a regularly scheduled meeting. Now we're into the, we're already. So, so just to clarify, it's it, it's unless we're, we're going to come up with a calendar, they're all going to be special meetings. No, I'm going to file a calendar. Okay, you're going to file a calendar. I'm going to file a calendar. Okay, that's the point of all. Okay, that's the point of all this. Um, the week of the sixth of the sixteenth, who cannot <laughs> do the week of the sixteenth? Two meetings. I think Monday, but Tom Hall might be closed. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, King Monday. Day. The King Day. So the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. I don't think I can do the 17th. You can't do the 17th. I don't think do the 17th. Every okay. other day, the rest of the month. The rest of the month. So how about who cannot do the 18th and the 20th? You can't do the 20th. So who cannot do both the 18th and the 19th? I can't do the 19th. You see the problem, folks? I have, a, I, I teach a class. Yeah, no, I, no, 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 no. Um, no one said no to the 18th. Yeah, so huh? no one said no to the 18th. The 18th, no, that's where, that's where we're on. Who cannot do the 18th? So the 18th is the next. I'm just I didn't hear. It's my birthday, but yeah, sing happy birthday to the other. We'll say okay. no, no, we'll again. That's going to appear on the agenda. Cupcakes all around. You know? So the 18th, 6.30, somewhere. Okay. That's not nearly enough. The week of the 23rd, who cannot do anything on the 23rd? I cannot do the 23rd. 20. The 23rd. You cannot do the 23rd. Yep. Who cannot do 24th? All right. Who cannot do? So you're available the 25th and the 26th. Okay. Is everyone available the 25th and the 26th? I'm not available on the 26th. Every, every, every Thursday from the 17th of January. I mean, the 19th of January, all the way through May, I teach on Thursday nights. So. Okay. Keep reminding me because we're going to go through this. Oh, I, I will. I will. Yeah. Keep reminding me. So Wednesday, the 25th, who cannot do Wednesday, the 25th? So Wednesday, the 25th is the next date. That's not enough. Now we're into the week of January and February. January 30. Um, who cannot do, Greg, you have the council meeting on the 31st, right? I do not. Oh, you do not? No, the 24th and the 10th. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Who, who cannot do one of those days, 30th, 31st, 1st, 2nd, or 3rd? Who cannot do one of those days? Okay. So. And do the second. Do the second. Jesse, so Thursdays are off limits. Okay, so Jesse can't do the second. 
but we can do Thursday, Monday the 30th. Yes? Yes. Yeah. We can do Tuesday the 31st. And we can do You can do three meetings in a week, too demanding. Anybody kicking and yelling about? The 30th, 31st, and February 1. It's three meetings in one week. All right, sold. If we need it, may not need it. So on, Assessing applications, we have one, two, three, four, five, six meetings if we need it. Should we stop there? Michael, I'm assuming if for, for inclement weather purposes, since we're in January, uh -huh. we're all agreeing that we have a meeting, let's meet on Zoom. All right, I think that should be our just agreement with this. With this yeah. Let's, you don't get a free pass for snowy roads. Yes. Zoom in. You don't have to drive in. You can do it from your house. Or Mike Lydon can pick you up. I, I will offer a livery service. The problem is I will not be driving. <laughs> um, so that's that. I don't need any more. We don't need a vote on it. Agendas are just going to go out. Um, on meeting procedures, that that's a placeholder. I had nothing specific in case we missed something. Is anyone meeting meeting procedures next step and feedback all in one? I mean, does anyone have any thoughts that it interesting strategic if you put that at the end of the meeting procedure? Yeah, because it's irrelevant. Sort of like it, because it, we, because it just doesn't matter. I mean, it just doesn't matter. But if someone, I mean this seriously, I mean, if someone wanted to modify the way I'm rolling out, you know, these issues and topics, we can modify, you know, we can, we can discuss it. I mean, I, that's why it's there. I mean, there's something that needs to be fixed and we just haven't touched on it. We can fix it. So anybody call me, if, call me if there's anything, there's a burr under your saddle, give me a call, we'll figure it out. Um, same with next steps. We've covered it. That's a placeholder feedback. I mean, just ask for that. So, Don't Mike, do we anticipate that you're going to be before the council on November? It depends if it's on the agenda, then I will go. Yeah, we have a meeting Tuesday, the next meeting, yeah. November 8th. Yeah, when it's on the agenda, I will go. Yeah. Um, approval of the minutes, we should do that. Um, I should approve the minutes of 9 21 22 as submitted. Second. Second. Bernadette, you got that? You're good. Okay, anyone opposed or abstaining from that? That's carried unanimously. And we run out of business. Motion so, for adjournment. Yeah, exactly. it's adjourned. 908, we're returned. That's not too bad. 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, that's not too bad.